you have any idea what that means? What all is associated with being a child of God? As wonderful as the comforts of the Holy Spirit are in our life, the sad truth is we have enemies in this world, do we not? The Bible says they're not flesh and blood, but they are very real spiritual forces of evil that sometimes work through people. Isn't it nice to know that you are a child of God? Some of you have heard this story, some have not. But one time when I was in Alaska, I was on a trail going to go fishing, all loaded up with gear and bait and everything but a firearm. <laughs> Didn't have one. And I came across this big old pile of bear dung that was uh, obviously very fresh. And I, I gave a moment's thought to turning around and going back the direction I went, but I thought to myself, man, I came all the way here to go fishing. I'm, you know, I'm just going to press on. And so I walked a little bit further, and all of a sudden I heard this big commotion in the brush, probably about from here to the corner of the building right here from where I was on the trail. And all of a sudden, this huge black bear, it wasn't a grizzly bear, but it was a very large black bear, come bursting up out of the brush, looked right at me, looked me right in the face, laid her ears straight back across her head and popped her teeth and woofed at me like a dog. And about that time, out came the first little cub. And then out came another little cub. And I can tell you this, the thought never crossed my mind to go over there and try to kick one of them cubs. It didn't even occur to me that it would be a good idea to try to pet one of those cubs. I didn't want to do anything but leave those cubs alone. And thank God, they went the other way, and she did too, but she kept her eye on me all the way. Isn't it a great thing to know that you are a child of God? He cares about you far more than that mother bear cares about those cubs. And believe me, the forces of darkness know that, and they realize that. And so never forget that we have nothing to fear on the face of this earth because we have a God who cares for his children. Amen. God bless you. You can have a seat. Hey, let's have a hand for our worship team. They did just a spectacular job again today. I just love to praise and worship the Lord. And another thing that I dearly love is to share a word from God with God's people because it's never a waste of time. <laughs> The Bible says that God's words are incredible. Those words don't always, in fact, rarely, they do on occasion, but they don't always produce instantaneous results. Sometimes they produce a instantaneous result, but they almost never produce everything that they're going to produce until they have a chance to grow and develop in our lives. So I want to share with you something that I think is a very important topic in today's world simply called divine guidance. How many of you appreciate knowing the fact that you have a God that not only is with you and around you and protecting you and defending you, but he's also guiding you. He's always also showing you where to go. Uh, one of the things that I appreciated about what Jesus said is he said, hey, one of my purposes for coming was to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Now, he turned around and said, the same way that my father sent me, now that I've done what I've done, I'm sending you. In other words, I want you, that to really sink in. You, have, you and I have the potential to absolutely destroy the works of the devil. But just like in my little analogy that I spoke about with the airplane, that, yeah, that's great. An airplane gives you the potential to fly, when, which you could never do in your own human strength. But did you know that ignorance of 
how to fly that airplane will keep you in the realm of only having the potential to escape gravity. You will never actually escape gravity until you learn how to fly. And that's why God wants to guide you and I into all of the truth so that we will be able to understand how to take advantage of the things that he has given us. Oh, thank you. I may take advantage of this in a little bit. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with a passage in John chapter 16, verses 13 through 15. Starts off by saying this, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. This was Jesus talking just before he was crucified and made it possible for the Holy Spirit to come. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. He will guide you into all truth. Now, just like Jesus said that he came to destroy the works of the devil, and just like he now said that I'm sending you in the same way, you have amazing potential, dynamic, explosive power. But think about this. What is perhaps the most essential part of a guided missile? Sure. It's nice if, it has, if it's equipped with a nuclear warhead that has all that power. But what good is a missile if it's not guided? If it's not guided, if it's just going to go off wherever, then it has the potential to do more harm than good. So that's why it's so important for us to understand, yes, we've been invested with incredible, amazing power, but God wants us to know that he has a guidance system. And first of all, that ought to be one of the most exciting things to ever hit your ears, because this word is full uh, this world is full of perplexing challenges and mysteries, and we have a promise from God that the Holy Spirit is willing and able to guide us into all truth. That means there's nothing that he can't help us to grasp or understand. There's no challenge that comes against us. There's nothing that can overwhelm us if if we are sensitive and aware of the voice of the Holy Spirit, if we know how to harmonize with God, we can see anything and everything that's devised against us demolished through the power of God. So he says, when the Spirit of comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you things to come. I think all of us have heard who knows how many stories of people who did terrible things, atrocious things. And if they lived to uh, tell about it and were actually captured afterwards and were asked, why? Why would you do something like that? Why? What is so often been their response. God told me to. Well, first of all, this says, he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear. First of all, let me tell you this. The Holy Spirit of the living God will never, ever tell you to do anything that is contrary to the words of God that are recorded in the Bible. He will never, he, he, he doesn't just say things that aren't in harmony with what's been recorded. So when we understand the fact that the Bible tells us, do not murder then we have sense enough to know we don't fly airplanes into towers. We don't get up on top of a building and start shooting people at random that we don't even know. But see, just that one little drop of ignorance in somebody, the devil knows how to use their desire to please God against them and get them to commit terrible things. So first of all, we have to understand the essential factor 
in understanding God's system of guidance for you and I is how critical it is that we come to an understanding of what he has recorded for us in the Bible because that's our first verifier. First of all, we look and see, wait a minute, I thought I heard this and it seemed like it sounded like God. But you know, the Bible even warns us there's plenty of imitation voices out there that can sound a lot like God and pretend to be God that have nothing to do with God. God, and that's why it's so essential that we gain an understanding of what God's words say so that we understand and recognize the imposters that would try to lead us astray. See, it's, it's a sad truth that we have enemies in this world. Now, the Bible tells us that those enemies are not flesh and blood, although they sometimes work through flesh and blood, but they're actually spiritual forces of wickedness and iniquity that are looking for a door of opportunity to use the ignorance of somebody who really genuinely thinks they're doing the will of God when they do something that's contrary to, as it could possibly be to his will. So that's why we understand that his premier way of speaking to us is to take God's word and to explain to us the depth and the significance of those words. Uh, I guess you could say, another way you could put that is that he shows us the proper applications of God's words. Now, in verse 14 says, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall shew it unto you. Now, who is, what is one of the titles that we have for Jesus. He is the what? He is the word of God. In fact, it says it's written right on his thigh, King of kings, Lord of lords. He is the word of God. So think about what I'm saying in this application of God's guidance system. He shall take, a, he shall glorify me for he shall receive of mine in other words, he shall receive. There are all kinds of mysteries and solutions to perplexing problems that are hidden and contained in the words of God. And the Holy Spirit, one of the things that he does is he leads us and guides us into all truth by taking those hidden mysteries, those things that are, have the potential to transform our lives and remove the limitations from us, and show us how they apply. All right, now, here's one thing that a lot of people fail to understand, and that is simply this. There is an order to learning. It, it, there is a specific order. God has an order for living, or for learning. Okay, so the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, whose job it is to lead us and guide us into all truth, he knows exactly where you and I are in our growth and development and maturity process. And so he knows exactly what the next step is for you and I. Out of the 50 or 100, however many people are hearing the words of God being spoken, the Holy Spirit in each one of you is able to take those exact same words and apply them to a different circumstance, a different situation for you right there. That's what is so amazing. That's why no man can glory in preaching the words of God because it's the Holy Spirit that takes those words and shows us as individuals, how they apply to our lives. So, in verse 15, it says, All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall shew it unto you. This is a profound and amazing statement. I'm going to give you just one example. In other words, there's another place, there's another scripture that's recorded, that says that everything that's necessary for life and godliness has been recorded in the words of God and is able to bring those realities to pass in your life. I want you to think for a minute about your past experience in school, however many years of school you went through. Think about how many textbooks you read during the process of that time. You know, um, 
perhaps, I don't know how many years of school you had, but it could take, you know, some of you might could squeeze them into a couple of suitcases. Most of you would probably take at least a pickup truck load to put all those textbooks in. Uh, some of you, it might take a semi truck or even a train, you know, <laughs> to carry all the books that you had to read to complete the educational process that you went through. So think about this. God, in his wisdom and his insight, he has put everything you will ever need for life to be like he is, which means godliness means like he is. Everything that you and I need for life and godliness is contained in one little Bible that you can stick in your pocket and carry with you. How is that possible? How is it possible that everything from a, an elementary type education through doctorates could all be condensed into one little book? I have one word for you that explains it. It's called seeds. I mean, think about this. You can carry around a pocket full of pinion nuts, <laughs> pine tree seeds or whatever, which would be easier to carry. A pocket full of pine tree seeds or 50 pine trees. But did you realize that anything and everything that is that it's required to produce those 50 pine trees would be able to fit in your pocket in the form of 50 seeds? So how did God do it? God did it like this. He simply said, hey, I'm sending my own spirit to dwell within you, to lead you and guide you into all truth. And these words, he, God doesn't fully elaborate concepts and topics in his word. He, they are seeds that are designed to produce an end result that perhaps isn't even recognizable compared to the little seed that was planted. But the truth of the matter is, it's going to revolutionize your life. So, seeds, all right? So, we have another, here's here, just another example of the wisdom, the amazing wisdom of God. I mean, think about this. How many of you have ever had to carry around five gallons of water, a five-gallon bucket of water? You ever done that? How far do you want to carry it? <laughs> not very, if water's heavy, is it not? So let's just think about this. What if we got an urgent update that, hey, you guys, you're right here in the vicinity, so you guys, there's not going to be any rainfall for the next several years, so it's your responsibility since you're right here at the base of South Mountain. We expect you to get buckets of water and go up there and water all those bushes and trees. That'd be a pretty big job for us, wouldn't it? You know, how much do you think that weighs, toting a five-gallon, and, and, and then five gallons isn't going to go all that far, you know? But God, you know, in his wisdom, he devised a way. I mean, think about this. One little rainstorm, just one little rainstorm. Look at all the water going down the gutters. How many thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of gallons of water can come from one little rainstorm? Can you imagine how much that weighs? But God in his wisdom was able to take, just like he was able to convince, condense anything and everything you need for life and godliness into one little Bible, as long as you got the Holy Spirit. He was able to take all that weight, millions of pounds of water, because he has to water all those plants and all those trees and all those creatures and everything that's out there and float it through the sky like it was lighter than a feather and then cause it to just descend gently to bring life and health and healing to all of those plants and creatures that would be doomed without it. That's the wisdom of our God. So think about that for a minute in his guidance system. You know, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest treasure that any person can ever experience or have on the face of the earth is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And we have a promise that once we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and he comes into our life that he will never leave us, he will never forsake us, 
and he will lead us into all truth. But did you know there's a big difference between leading you into all truth and dragging you into all truth? See, here's the thing. He has the potential to do that, but it's up to you and I, the hunger that we have for his words. It's up to us to make the decision. I want to discover what's available to me in Christ. I want to learn how to destroy the works of the devil. I want to be a guided, precise missile. I don't want to just randomly go off and make a big bang somewhere and not have any long-term lasting effect when it comes to annihilating the destructive works of darkness that are trying to bring so much death and destruction to the people that are on the face of the earth. So what the sad reality of the fact is, is although the Holy Spirit will never leave us and never forsake us, guess what does leave us and forsake us? What does leave us and forsake us from time to time is the awareness of that wonderful reality. You know, I don't know about you, I was not a perfect kid. <laughs> there were times, there were times that, uh, that I did things that I knew good and well, I should not be doing this, you know? But I reasoned in my mind, eh, but it's no big deal, because mom and dad, you know, they were my chief account, people that helped me in account. Mom and dad's not around. They don't know. <laughs> so, so I thought I could get away with doing this or that. And I don't know if this ever happened to you, but a time or two, I thought that they, when I thought they weren't around and they weren't aware, Lo and behold, I found out they were there, <laughs> and they were aware, you know? And so, yes, think about this. The Holy Spirit dwells within you and I. He wants to bring comfort, encouragement, hope, and help. But the Bible tells us, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by being a critical, fault-finding finger pointer because that grieves him because that's not what he wants to do. And, but sometimes we can lose sight of that reality that the that this Holy Spirit of God dwells within us. And that as Christians, when we say or do something, we're assigning his name to whatever it is that we've said or done. How many of you would appreciate an identity theft, you know, <laughs> where somebody assumes your name and your title, but they do something that you would never do. Well, you know, we have to understand. <laughs> Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. This is not a new problem. The apostle talked about this a long time ago. He says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. So first of all, I need to remind myself, you know, I need to remind myself, I'm not the boss of me. You know, just because I feel like doing something, just because I feel like saying something, doesn't mean that I have the right to do that because, because I'm the representative of God on the face of the earth to people who don't know him, who already think that he hates their guts for the most part because they are aware of all of their faults and failures. So I'd just like to point out this. I mean, I see, an, I see a benefit. Not only do I see an admonition to remember that I'm not the boss of me, but I also see a benefit in this, in this scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, where he says, and ye are not your own. Well, what that also means is I'm not on my own. I'm not like a cub without a mama bear standing right there. You know, that's one of the things, you know, <laughs> you wouldn't want to stick your finger in the eye of a bear. You know? <laughs> but one of the things that the Lord said is that when people are picking on his people, sometimes that's the effect it has on him. It's like sticking your finger in Jehovah's eye. He said, <laughs> that's not a good idea. But at any rate, my point is, I'm not my own. I'm not on my own, though. See, I am never alone. You are never alone. If you have asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, you've got the Holy Spirit of the living God who's just waiting 
to show you the potential that exists in your life and is yearning, but he's not going to impose his purposes and plans on our lives because that's contrary to his nature. Okay, so uh, there's another uh, observation that I've made. I don't know if you've noticed this, but God makes allowances for the weak and for the immature. Aren't you glad about that? Aren't you glad that God, because if we're sitting here saying, well, look, I realize how important it is that I learn God's words, that I study his words, that I start becoming more and more aware, because I know that's a critical part of his guidance system. But did you know that we serve a practical God as well? And did you know that that's the very nature of his, of, of the gospel, is that God is willing to make up for our weaknesses. So think about this. This is how smart God is. Yeah, it is. And this is no uh, deterrent to making every effort to research and find out everything that's in the words of God. But what about all those newborn children of his that haven't had a chance or haven't had time to study and reflect and meditate on his words? How, how is, what about guidance for them? You know, what's God going to do for, for, for people who haven't yet experienced that? Did you know, uh, look at this, it, it, it says, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 36, in verses 26 and 27, I'm going to read this to you in a moment. But for starters, one of the things that God has done for those who have just recently been born again or become a child of God, is the Bible says that he adds to the church daily such as should be saved. We, we can't talk about God's guidance system for your life without pointing out the fact that he realized and recognized there's going to be a time where you're going to be pretty darn reliant, just like with a little child that's first been born. They're very reliant about other people. It's a process before they get to where they are self-sufficient in their own sufficiency, so to speak. So, the Bible says that God established the church, and the reason why he adds to the church daily, such as should be saved, is so that we can have the benefit of teachers and preachers and pastors and people who will be able to share insights with us to help us understand how to harmonize with what we have been given as a result of our new relationship with God. Okay? But... I want to add something else to this that's really amazing. It's astonishing to me when you think about it, and that's why uh, I turn to this verse right here. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27, God foretold, this is what I mean when I say that God makes special allowances for our weakness. How many of you know there was an old covenant it was full of all these things that told us exactly what God's will was. And under that old covenant, there were all kinds of promises that if you do this, and if you do that, and if you don't do this, and you don't do that, then this will be the wonderful result. But do you know what happened under the old covenant? Again and again, people, even though they knew what they should do, didn't do it. <laughs> And so God, in his love is so great that he said, you know what, I'm not, I'm not satisfied with that. I'm going to make a new covenant that's not based on your willpower and your ability. Yes, we want to make every effort. We want to make every effort to learn everything we can from God's word. But I want to assure you that you are not vulnerable right now at this moment, no matter what your level of development is, because God has made up a plan B for you while you're in the process of refinement and development. So he says, this is talking about this new covenant. He said, a new heart also will I give you. Now, before, it was all about what you did. But I want you to notice all the eyes. All the eyes are what God, this is, the new covenant is all about the eyes. 
not the U's. The old covenant was all about the U's. The new covenant is all about the I's. God says, you know what? I'm going to make up for their weakness. I'm going to make up. Yeah, I know. They should do this and they shouldn't do that. But I know they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And so I'm, I'm not satisfied to see them destroyed just because they made a mistake. So I am going to do this and I am going to do that because I am determined to see them succeed. What a great God that is. He, there's nothing hard to flee. He says, a new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. Oh, my gosh. And cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. You know, I believe this next passage we're, that I'm going to read right here, I believe that Paul was using this passage as proof positive of the fulfillment of this new covenant. And you'll see how it applies to what I'm talking about right now. Because how many of you realize and recognize, I don't care who you are and how, I know I've been making a genuine effort for many, many years to discover what I need to discover. But did you know I still have all kinds of room for improvement in my life? There's still all kinds of vulnerabilities that exist. I am so grateful for the fact that I have a God who makes up for my weaknesses and those things that I haven't discovered. He's stepping in on my behalf, just like Mama Bear stepped in on behalf of them cubs, said, don't mess with my kids. That's the way our God is. So here, I believe Paul was pointing to the, variety, to the validity of the fact that, no, this new he just promised he's going to give you a new heart. He's going to give you a new spirit. He's saying, that's not just fancy words. That's a real thing that happened. And, and there's something unique about this. So he says in Romans chapter 2, and verse 14 and 15, it's worth reading in the Amplified. Paul's pointing to people who didn't even have a Bible yet. They're Gentiles. They've, they haven't been brought up hearing about the words of God. All they heard about was the fact that Jesus Christ died for their sins, and if they would invite him to come into their lives, they could become new creatures. They could get this new spirit. They could get this new heart. They could have his spirit come to the inside of them. None of those things because of what they did to earn it or deserve it, but simply because they received it. So he says, hey, the Gentiles who have not the divine law. The divine law is found where? In the Bible. He said, these guys don't even have a Bible. He says, do, and look at that next word, instinctively what the law requires. They are a law to themselves since they do not have the law. In other words, they don't even have, the they haven't even heard the commandment yet. But now, because they have a new nature, instinctively they become aware of things that are the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. Okay? So then he says, they show that the essential requirements of the law are written in their hearts. And that what God said he would do? I'll write them in your hearts. And they are operating there with their conscience, their sense of right and wrong also bearing witness, and their moral decisions, their arguments of reason, their condemning or approving thoughts will accuse or perhaps defend and excuse them. So let me just say this about all that. God has given you and I a new nature. And so part of his guidance system is now, even when you haven't even read a scripture about this or that, even when it falls into a category, there are all kinds of things, and we're excited about it. We're learning. We want to grow. We're doing everything we can to grow. But even when we haven't yet made that discovery, there is an instinctive awareness within us because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in this new nature that we have that lets us know, no, this is not the right thing to do, and no, or yes, that is the right thing to do. 
that insight actually carries over into so many practical things where there isn't even a scripture that tells you to take Avalon Drive or to take Earl. But you know what? God says, I will lead you into all truth. I, you know, once you're aware of the fact that the indwelling presence is trying to feed you some information that pertains to the decisions that you're making, you can tap into that, and boy, does that become a benefit in our lives. And so I think it's just wonderful not to, not to try to devalue our studies and our efforts and everything that we do to harmonize our behavior because we, sh obviously, we want to do anything and everything we can to learn how to fly this airplane and to learn how to operate all the unique defense systems that are there that don't benefit at all until we know how, what we have and how to use it. But still, God says, listen, let me just put it to you this way. There may be all kinds of things that your conscience is not aware of yet when you haven't studied and researched some of these things. But let me just put it to you this way. The things that you are aware, when, you, when there is something that is telling you, you may not understand why, you may not understand any of the, the, the things to it, but all you know is, I just know this doesn't feel right. I know I'm not supposed to go this way. I know I'm not supposed to do this. I know that I should do this. I don't understand why, but I do, I, I just sense that. I have an instinctive awareness of that. Well, I'll tell you what, when the Holy Spirit sends up a red flag in my conscience, I have learned the hard way, do not ignore that flag. Because there may be all kinds of things that I haven't learned yet, but the things that I have learned, the Holy Spirit knows how to push that button and the, the warning signal comes on, you know. It may sound like a little bit of an irritation, you know, to fasten your seatbelt or, or whatever, but believe me, He's got your best interests in mind. And so I believe, I'm going to sum up with this final scripture right here in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20. I believe that this is what he was in reference to. He says, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Now, now wait a minute. Ye know all things? I mean, there's all kinds of things that I realize I don't know. I don't understand electricity, you know. I don't understand, you know, plenty of things. Why this is this way or why that's that way. But what's he really saying? What's he getting at? Obviously, if the Bible highly encourages us that it's through the knowledge of him that those things that are possibilities become realities. And he makes every, he gives us every encouragement to learn, then why would he make a statement like, you know all things? But I, see, what I believe is, it's that unction that he's talking about. That's what I'm saying. No matter how immature you are as a Christian, as a believer, you have the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have a new nature. You may not understand this or that, but he will let you know if you're listening what is the right step to take and what's the wrong path. Amen? Amen. God bless you. I hope you got something out of this. I am two minutes early. That shows that miracles still exist on the face of the earth. There's five chapters in, uh, in 1 Peter, and in chapter th 3, you know what it starts off with? Finally, my brethren. <laughs> so so when a, I, I, I determined from that that when a pastor or a preacher, when we say we're done, it means absolutely nothing. Anyway, <laughs> but we're done. Two minutes early. God bless you. Father, I just thank you for the power of the seeds of these, your words. I thank you that you are dedicated to our success. I thank you for the indwelling presence, the treasure, the lover of our soul, the, the, the highest 
and most wonderful thing that we can experience on the face of the earth is to enjoy the presence of your own Holy Spirit. We appreciate that, and we appreciate all the guidance you bring and the comfort you give. I just ask that you watch over these people, that you keep them safe and sound, and keep them on the path of discovery. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord.